uh, ladies and gentlemen, we actually are, are delighted that, you know, one of the things that we did early on uh, from the standpoint of the Great British Chamber is that we engaged with a lot of our members who were actually working and, and, and working in the space of COVID-19 response. Um, I will tell you in particular, uh, our lawyers and our bankers have been some of the folks who've been the busiest uh, as it relates to uh, responding to this uh, pandemic. Uh, bankers, uh, definitely as it relates to these uh, paycheck protection program and the opportunities that have been extended through the SBA and other places. But then also our lawyers who have been helping to make give us heads of tails of legislation, implications with employment law, so on and so forth, employee rights. And one of the folks who have led the way in, uh, for us, have, uh, first of all, I want to thank Ben Adams, who's been right there, Johnny on the spot, working with the chamber. But I also want to appreciate just overall Baker Donaldson and their COVID-19 response team. And right now with us, we have Angie Banks, who is a shareholder with Baker Donaldson. And we look forward to hearing from her. And I'm going to pitch it over to Angie at this point. Angie. Thank you so much, Bobby, and thank you, Mayor Harris and Beverly, for having me today. This has been um, on behalf of Mr. Donaldson. You are absolutely correct that um, us employment lawyers, we've been very busy during this pandemic. As Mayor out earlier, um, things are changing pretty rapidly in terms of what the expectations are for you as employers. So we want to focus today on talking about the time to return to work. We have started Return to work on the state level, level with the governor's um, Tennessee pledge that was issued. We're looking at city and county level um, that should be protocols that should be coming out soon. We've seen the phase in protocols that we don't have dates yet, but we have phases in which industries are going to be going back to work uh, based on which phase they're indicated. To kind of go over today some of the basic things that all employers need to be thinking about when we're excited and we're ready to get back to work, we want to get our employees back to work, but we need to do so cautiously. And so following some of the directives that I'm going to go over with you today are from the governor's Tennessee pledge, from um, the CDC, and from OSHA in terms of guidance. Now, obviously, this is going to be very industry specific. And so if you have an office environment versus a restaurant versus a hair salon, what you need to do is going to be very different. So I'm going to cover some of the general topics today um, as we go through. So let's start by talking about the Tennessee Pledge. And, and Angie, this is Bobby here. We're having a little, we're, we're breaking up a bit. I just wanted to make sure you were aware your voice is breaking up. We do have your presentation up as you're able to see. Just wanted to mention that to you. Okay, sorry about that. Is that any better? Yes, that's, uh, that's better. Okay, great. So this is the Tennessee Pledge that was issued by the governor, and we're going to cover these types of topics today in terms of return to work. We need to create a safe working environment for your employees as they return to work, and that is going to focus on these areas. Social distancing, cleaning and disinfecting, wearing of PPE, and again, that's going to be very dependent on what your workforce is, screening of employees and customers, and then implementing and updating your employee illness policy. So let's start by talking a little bit about social distancing. Um, you know, we're going to have to be teaching our employees sort of the new normal when they come back to work. It's going to be very, a very different environment depending on where you are. First of all, physical changes to work areas. You're supposed to have a minimum of six feet between workstations. So you may need to be reconfiguring your workplace and what that looks like. You may need to be putting up dividers for protection or other types of line work if you're in a production type facility. Distancing your employees as far apart as possible within that six foot parameter. Sneeze guards or plexiglass barriers. We've seen that around town as you start going to different stores, retail establishments, grocery stores and the like. They have started putting up the plexiglass in between um, the person who doing the transaction and the customer. So that is some uh, ideas that you might take if you were in a retail type establishment. I've seen some of the protocol for restaurants talking about 
that uh, the server should be wearing masks. A lot of uh, employers are doing that as well. Um, decrease any unnecessary interaction. You know, a lot of the offices and workplace environments are deciding that they are not going to allow vendors or family members, people who do not have an absolute business need to be here, to be in that particular area. They're also focusing on limiting the use of common areas, such as break rooms and bathrooms. Consider having one to two people in the bathroom at a time. Um, breaks should be staggered. So everybody on the production line should not take a break at the same time. We should stagger production lines, stagger breaks um, to limit the amount of people who are in those common areas. And then again, when there is a common area, we need to ensure social distancing. Now we've had some questions from clients about tables and social distancing and what happens if you have kind of booths or areas for your employees and how do you determine and enforce that social distancing. You can put a placard or a sign on a booth that says, you know, this booth should not be seated to comply with the social distance um, requirements to make sure that your employees do not sit next to each other in those booths. They are assigning certain bathrooms for certain employees. So if you work on the 19th floor of the office building, you could use the 19th floor restroom. That way, if there is a positive COVID um, test result for an employee, we know where that employee has been. We know that person didn't use the restroom on the 14th floor and that sort of thing. Limiting elevator capacity. This is gonna be kind of a huge issue if you're in a large office building and there's some bottlenecking going on. According to following CDC guidelines, really you shouldn't have more than two people in an elevator at a time. We're asking people to use their best judgment, limiting really to three or four people at a time and asking employees to follow that and use their best judgment. If the elevator door is open and this was six months ago and there were five people in the elevator, none of us would have thought twice about hopping on that elevator. Now we have to think twice and we have to enforce those policies. And then obviously any other work specific rules to encourage and demonstrate social distancing. Um, some types of aisle directions or hallway directions are an example of that. Uh, stagger work and break and meal periods we've talked about a little bit. Essentially we want to encourage your employees to create new patterns of behavior. This is a new workplace. So limit the in-person groups and meetings and the number of attendees in those meetings. So for example, if it used to be that you would have a Monday morning all hands on deck meeting where you're in a conference room, you know, nowadays we're doing things like this. We're having virtual meetings, we're doing Zoom meetings or doing conference calls. And even if you're in an environment where you might normally walk next door to talk to the person who's in the cubicle next to you or in the office next to you, we are seeing and suggesting that people and companies create rules around that. If you could go walk next door, we're asking you not to. Instead, pick up the phone, have a phone call, have a Zoom conference. Uh, also, any type of common areas like break room, uh, where you go make coffee in the morning, where people sometimes will congregate together, we're asking to shut those down or limit the amount of people in there. So, for example, if there's an area where your employees go and get coffee in the morning, then maybe say only two people allowed in here at a time. We're asking employees to bring all of their own uh, utensils or to use disposable utensils with lunch, dinner, that kind of thing. Um, use signage to clearly provide social distance rules and instructions. We want you to put signs up throughout the facility, limiting the number of people in bathrooms and that sort of thing. And certainly in bottleneck locations. So if you have a workforce where everybody clocks in in the same area at the same time, uh, tape off social distancing so that people are ensured to be six feet apart as they're clocking in and expect that your employees are going to take a little bit longer to clock in or to get on and off that elevator. The next area we're going to cover is enhanced cleaning procedures. Essentially, you need to make sure that you're complying with CDC and OSHA guidelines in terms of cleaning. I'm suggesting that if you have an outside cleaning service come in, you need to make sure that you have an acknowledgement or a certification from them in writing that they are following and meeting CDC guidelines, that they are using CDC approved supplies. I wanna put that burden on that third party company that I'm hiring to come in and do that for me. I'm also going to ask that you keep records of what time you cleaned that area. 
And then obviously for the common things that people touch like uh, doorknobs or buttons on elevators or light switches and the like, um, in, uh, doors, entry doors to bathrooms and that sort of thing, we're going to need to disinfect those more often than once a day. So we're suggesting do that um, you know, every few hours and make sure that you've done that. With regard to um, uh, PPE, you need to procure and prepare necessary supplies. I sent Trade some emails this morning. We are finding that it is finally easier to find hand sanitizer and face mask and the like. Now, depending on which type of work exposure risk your company is by OSHA, it will tell you what type of PPE you should suggest or provide. So for example, mask, gloves, eye protection, uh, other type of specific um, equipment protection, depending on what situation you might be in. You might need to have some type of a face guard. Uh, workspace dividers, separating areas, having common uh, office space dividers or cubicles placed. Uh, provide additional cleaning supplies. So um, hand sanitizer, sanitizing wipes from the common areas so that people can clean their own workspace. And then if you can, provide hand sanitizer in as many areas as possible, not just in the restroom, but in the entryways, by the elevators, um, by the production line, that sort of thing. Obviously, I know that there's been some discussions on prior um, presentations about the ability to take temperature of your employees or customers, even as they enter the building. And if you decide to do this, then make sure that you have the appropriate non-touch thermometers available to do that. Um, one of the other things that was covered and suggested in the governor's pledge was to have a new or updated written illness policy. You know, in the past, we've always told our employees, don't come to work when you're sick. But I'm probably one of the people who's guilty. If I just had a cold and it was six months ago, I would have come into work. I mean, I rarely ever miss work. That's just kind of how I am. I prefer to go to work. It's easier for me to work in the office environment. All that has changed. And so with the new or updated illness policy, basically you need to put in writing to your employee, do not come to work if you have a confirmed diagnosis of COVID-19, if you have symptoms of COVID-19, or if you have been exposed to someone with a confirmed diagnosis of COVID-19. Now we've received a ton of phone calls on this and, it, and you're gonna have to take that on a case-by-case -case basis. But if you have a situation where somebody says, well, I had dinner last night with my cousin and his brother's girlfriend was diagnosed last week, that's probably too far um, removed to have to say that person needs to quarantine. But again, as the rapidly changing rules were, look at CDC guidance. And just as of yesterday, the CDC has updated their symptoms for COVID to include some new symptoms. So you need to be following those every day to make sure that you know what the, the current symptoms are so that you can advise your employees of that. So if they do, so those are what the responsibility is for the employee. For the employer, if you receive, if someone has the symptoms or if they have a temperature, obviously you need to have a policy in place, isolate the employee, send them home, tell them to go talk with a physician, disinfect their workspace in the common areas, and then follow OSHA and CDC guidelines. I will point out that um, under the Shelby County Health Department, Sometimes you may be required to provide information as to who that person was around. You do not have to disclose to those coworkers which employee has been tested positive for COVID, but you may need to share with the health department um, who the names and identities of the coworkers were that they were around, which is why it's important for you to know that. Um, and then just to finish out, employee training, include some new training, and it doesn't have to be anything um, in depth, just basic training about wearing a face mask, um, you know, prohibiting employees from using each other's telephones and computers, training on the illness policy, training on the social distancing and what the expectations are, training on personal hygiene and cleaning, such as, you know, washing your hands. Again, we're trying to create a new pattern of behavior here in the workforce. And then last, but certainly not least, ensure that you have OSHA compliance. So I encourage all of you to Google this um, OSHA COVID-19, and if you Google the numbers 3990, that will take you to the worker exposure risk diagram for COVID. And there uh, you get to assess what occupational hazards your workers may be exposed to depending on 
how OSHA has identified your workforce as very high risk of exposure, high risk, medium risk, or low risk. And the majority of employees are in low to medium risk. So follow that OSHA guidance that will tell you what PPE you need to provide, hazard assessments, and reporting requirements. Okay, ready for some questions. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for that, Angie. Are there any questions we're going to stop that share? Are there, are there any questions that we can receive from folks? Uh, I also should mention this. Um, Angie, I did have a couple of them that were shared previously, and what I'll do is we'll put your picture back up so we'll be able to see your picture and think of you. Um, I, want, I want to, regarding what some might um, call landmines, like from the employment, um, from employment law, um, and just in terms of things, there's so many things that you should do, but what are the things to watch out for? For instance, you mentioned the uh, taking of employee temperature. I mean, the, and you also mentioned, for instance, um, or, or in, 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 in how that works or should work or could work. You also mentioned the, the piece of individuals who might be infected with COVID-19 that not becoming public knowledge uh, at the job site. So are, are there a couple of things that come to mind in terms of uh, landmines to watch out for or things you should be careful of uh, as it relates to employee rights and just uh, legal ramifications? Sure, absolutely. Um, good point about um, identifying the person. If you do have an employee who tests positive for COVID and they contact you, they will also, their physician who, who gives them the positive test will go through the process of reporting to the necessary authority. So that's not your obligation as the employer, but what your obligation is, is to work with the health department um, and provide to them information that that person might be exposed to. Now, with regard to the individual who was diagnosed, it's very important that that is private HIPAA protected information that they have been uh, received a positive test. And so you're not to share the employee's identity with coworkers. However, that being said, you need to give them enough information to know whether they have been exposed to the person, which kind of puts employers in an awkward position. Obviously, if you work on a production line and all of a sudden uh, John Doe is no longer coming into work every day and then you receive an email that someone tested positive, people may be able to figure out who it is. But sometimes it may be more generic than that and you may need to be able to send an email out saying, you know, there is an employee who worked in the, this office building on this floor and used these common areas that has tested positive. And if you use the common areas and work on the same floor and may have come into contact with that employee, you may need to quarantine yourself or go see um, testing and, and be on the lookout for symptoms and the like. The EEOC is allowing still people to take temperatures of their employees as they come in. Again, privacy issues are key here. They should be social distanced when they're coming in to have their temperatures taken if you're going to implement that at your workplace. But you also need to be very careful to be um, uh, confidential in this regard. Any records related to temperature testing and the like need to be kept in a separate file. And you don't need to share an employee's temperature with other people. And so if they do have 100.4 or higher temperature, then you're supposed to follow the CDC guidance, which is to separate them out, provide them with a mask, send them home to seek medical treatment, and then to follow the return to work guidelines posted by the CDC. But again, that should all be kept very confidential. Now, you know, talk about landmines. There are several high profile employers that have been all over the news where there have been massive breakouts, whether it be in a nursing home or a meatpacking facility and the like. So obviously, if you have a massive breakout like that, you need to call the Shelby County Health Department, work closely with them, you know, control media coverage and the same. There needs to be a message. There needs to be a person speaking on behalf of the company. You need to be coordinated with the health department and the like. And in those types of situations, you may be looking at workers' compensation claims for this. We've seen several of those being filed recently where an employee clearly or most likely 
got the virus at work. Now that's a hard thing to prove in a lot of instances, but if you work in a facility that has a high um, positive test result, then they may be able to trace it back to work, in which case you need to work with the employee to complete the first report of injury and go through the workers' comp benefits that might be available to them. Yeah, so to the extent that one of the things we're looking at is, um, uh, one of the things that you would say is that the employee needs to, the employer, demonstrating their um, pro, being proactive as it relates to measures that are in place to, uh, quite frankly, uh, protect the protect staff and prevent outbreak, that those are things that, you know, there's a culpability if, in fact, those things aren't in place. Is that what, is that what you would say? Yes, and you need to be documenting all of this. So document all of these efforts. Document yeah. that you're offering PPE, that you have a new... Okay. Um, illness uh, guide and plan. Have have employees sign off on that. Document that you've done your training so that if you do receive a lawsuit, we lawyers need to use that documentation of your training and that sort of thing to be able to defend the lawsuit. I hear documentation of efforts, uh, prevention and protection efforts, and also hear confidentiality. That I'm, I'm sorry, I, sometimes I hear complicated things in simple ways, but uh, I think that it hits quite a bit of what you're mentioning right along through here. I have a question that's come in. I'm going to ask this of you. Uh, are employers allowed to ask screening questions of an employee when they return from taking one day off sick? The employee does not divulge what their illness was is. Um, are you able to speak to that? Okay, absolutely you can ask. Now, again, Things are changing rapidly. Uh, six months from now, you may not be able to. Six months ago, you were not able to. Now you can. The EEOC has given us very specific guidance. You are absolutely allowed to ask an employee when they return to work. If they say they were off sick the day before, you need to ask them specific questions. And the questions that the EEOC allows you to ask them are, you know, are you experienced any, any of these symptoms of COVID? Were you out because of shortness of breath, sore throat, um, chills, aches and pains? Some of the newer um, symptoms that are being discussed are diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, those sorts of things. So you can ask all those questions of the employee and they're required to answer you on those questions. That is great information. Uh, I'm also um, wanting to, uh, this is, uh, we have just a couple more minutes here. So I want to ask you this as well. Um, regarding the time uh, that, um, talk to us regarding travel. I, I guess maybe the same, some, some version of the same would apply. Uh, for instance, um, there is a uh, individual who has traveled uh, and, the, and your ability that is non-work related. Uh, travel that is non-work related that uh, an employee has taken, uh, what are the, you know, potential abilities that the employee, uh, employer has to ask questions or, or around that, uh, given the, you know, number of hotspots that exist nationally and internationally? What are, what are... Yeah, that's a great question. We, especially now, since we're seeing a little bit of lightning in terms of uh, restrictions. We're seeing people saying, well, I'm going to go to my lake house for the weekend, or I'm going to go to Florida to my beach house for the week, um, which might be one of the hot spots. So when they return from any kind of social travel, you absolutely can ask them where they have traveled to, where it has been. If it is a hot spot, you can require them to self-quarantine for up to 14 days or consistent with whatever the most recent CDC guidance is, which I, I we presume will be lower as time goes by. Uh, one of the other things that we're seeing a lot of employers um, do in terms of return to work is revising these travel policies. And so no work travel related unless it's absolutely necessary and it has to be pre-approved at the very highest of company level, CEO, CFO, and that sort of thing. But on personal travel, if people choose to go on vacation or choose to go to their lake house, you can prevent them from coming into the workplace if they have been in a hot spot or a zone where they may be carrying the virus and you are not required um, to pay them for that time off if they purposely chose to go do that on their own and then they need to self-quarantine for that time period. Um, very good information. 
Are there any other comments or questions that anyone has? I'm looking here in my, making sure I'm not missing anything here. Okay. All right, well, Angie, we appreciate you all so much. Thank you so much for everything that uh, Baker Donaldson continues to do. Please give our best to Ben. Um, and, and I will tell you that lawyers uh, just have an ability right along through here to be so helpful and, and the information you've shared today. We definitely will be following up. Any information that you'd like to share with us, we'll make sure it gets out to the group. And uh, the other thing that I heard loud and clear is EEOC. The guidelines EEOC is providing uh, insuring employers are making uh, paying attention to those. So thank you so much, Angie Davis, for being with us. Thank you.